Hi, this is Dr. Steven Seiler. I'm coming to you again from my home office here in Norway. Uh, it's been a while since I made a video, but I'm catching up a bit and I needed this particular video for some teaching as well. Uh, before the pandemic, December 2019, I gave a lecture down in Brazil uh, in Campinas about sports technology and developments in that area. And so I thought I would basically reproduce that video that or that presentation uh, for you uh, with some updates because two years have gone by. So uh, we're going to talk about this, uh, achieving and extending peak performance in sports. And, and what is the role or what has been the role of science and technology and, and, and what is the developing role today. Now, sports science is a field that is made up of many sub-disciplines, and, and I'm a sports scientist with a focus on physiology. And in sports science, we kind of go two different directions. Sometimes we use the scientific method and our tools of science to improve sports performance, or at least we try. And other times, we study human function through the lens of exercise or sports training and performance. So we can go both directions, but right now I've got the hat of the of this performance-oriented sports scientist on. And we can start by asking the question, what single technological innovation has had the most profound impact on sport and the sport training process? Now think about that. What would you say yourself? Well, I would say it's this. It's the stopwatch. And the first stopwatch, believe it or not, was developed all the way back in 1816 by this rather unathletic-looking gentleman who was a fantastic watchmaker named Louis Monet. And the accuracy or the precision of the watch at that time was actually in the sixth of a second. Uh, interestingly enough. And he was mostly interested in, in astronomy, uh, not sports. But the ability to carefully measure time changed sports, and it changed the way we think about and the way we compete in sports. And if we go a little bit forward in time, this company, Omega, uh, already existed in 1932, and they supplied 30 stopwatches for the 1932 Olympics in uh, Berlin. Think about that. The entire Olympics, there were 30 stopwatches available to cover 14 sports and 117 events, but there weren't that many stopwatches available. By 2016, Omega, the same company, sent 480 people and 450 tons of timing equipment to Rio for the same purpose. So it says something about uh, the role of time and timekeeping in sports. And of course, we have this term, sitis, altis, fortis, that says something about uh, faster, higher, stronger. And that's kind of the idea of sports implicitly or explicitly. And, and the first Olympics in 1896 you know, the, the actual perf training level of the athletes was very different. And, and one example of this is this individual. This is Robert Garrett. He was a track and field athlete at Princeton. Uh, I think 14 athletes from the United States competed in the Olympics in 1896. And I believe they were all essentially from Princeton. And they went over on a ship. And Robert competed in a couple of different events, two or three, I believe. In one of them, he decided he was going to compete in the discus. And this was not an obvious decision because Robert had never thrown a discus before and never even seen one. Uh, and so he actually tried to reproduce a discus based on some drawings from antiquity. And the discus he ended up having produced was about three times the size of the actual discus, and it was completely useless. So he went to the Olympics having never thrown and never seen a discus. And then in the first two attempts, his discus kind of 
went through the air like a like a wounded bird but on the third he got it to spin reasonably well and he actually won the gold medal to the chagrin of the greeks who had invented that particular event so that that tells you something about the the beginnings of uh, high performance sport it was a it was a different time and if we move forward through various olympiads you could almost say that the uh, the beginning of the modern era of high performance sports arguably began here at the summer olympics 1952 this is post world war ii this is kind of the beginnings of the Cold War, and here you see the a picture from the final of the 3,000 meter steeplechase. And these two competitors are in the lead, Vladimir Kazantsev from the Soviet Union, Horace Arschenfelter from the United States of America. And what is particularly interesting here is, is that Kazantsev is uh, a member of the KGB. He works for the KGB. Horace Arschenfelter works for the FBI. So, uh, although not the CIA, the FBI, but this was a classic kind of moment in sports, and it typified and, and depicted what was happening, which was that sports began to be a proxy for geopolitical competition. And, and that's, in a way, a good thing, because instead of shooting at each other, at least, some of these competitions were resolved or held on the battlefield of sports instead. And so if you take the hard, cold numbers that were made possible by timekeeping, you take the Cold War, which created a, a competitive environment that led to taking training very seriously and, and becoming very systematic about trying to produce athletes that could win gold medals for their country. And then you add in the development of television, which provided both visibility for sports, but it also provided income. It provided uh, commercial television and people sitting in sofas watching and uh, also seeing commercials. And so you then had this kind of set of ingredients, this perfect storm of conditions which have kind of brought us where we are today with modern high performance sport. And today, of course, we no longer have to hope every four years for the opportunity to, to see certain sports. That's how it was for me as a kid. We can see whatever sport we want essentially any time of the day via television. Uh, whether it's fast TV that if you if you go and get a cup of coffee you may miss the knockout or slow TV where the athletes ski around in circles for two hours all of those are available to us uh, at essentially any time now in that environment the performances have improved dramatically and in first we could show it is a typical kind of progression that we've seen. Here's the 800 meter for men and for women. Uh, this is the men in blue, the women in, in orange. And what you see in both cases is a lot of development in the early decades of the last hundred years. years. But over the last, say, 40 years, uh, very little further progression uh, because the athletes are training about at the limits of what they can. And in sports like the 800 meter, which is primarily a low technology event, there's not a lot to be gained by new advances in technology. So we've seen very small changes in these performances. Now here's an example of a, a sport that, uh, where there have been some changes just recently, but it, it almost is the exception that proves the rule. This is the 400 meter world record projection, uh, world record progression, 400 meter hurdles from uh, before 1920 all the way to the 2020 Olympics, which were held uh, just this summer in 21. And you see the world record progression. And, and of course, the great Edwin Moses brought the world record down and held the world record for a long time. Then Kevin Young broke the world record in 1992, as I recall. And only in 2021 
the world record was broken by Norwegian Karsten Varholm. And what's quite interesting, which we've seen before, is that when the record first was broken, there was a big breakthrough time. And so in the final of the, of the Olympics, he ran a time which, which significantly broke the existing world record or the, the recent world record that had held, been held for many years. And so a fantastic performance, but it's worth noting that not only tremendous training and tremendous talent has gone into that performance, but also new technology, shoes. And even the coach of Varholm, who I spoke to myself, said, yes, the shoes have made a difference and they have trained specifically to be able to tolerate the stiffer shoe. These are the actual shoes worn, or at least two, one of each for each athlete of the two gentlemen, Varholm and Rye Benjamin, that were, they both broke the world record in the same event. Benjamin got second, but he still broke the existing world record. So now the IAAF tests the shoes as part of any world record. And what we see is they are extremely light and extremely stiff. They are different than the shoes that Edwin Moses wore and Kevin Young wore. And, and that's probably contributing to uh, some of that remarkable performance improvement. Now, that's an example of innovation. And innovation is a buzzword in just about every field of endeavor. And there's different terms that are used to describe what innovation means. Fresh thinking that creates value. Research is converting money to ideas. Innovation is converting ideas to money and so forth. In sports, where has the innovation come from? Has it come from science? Has it come from coaches, athletes? Primarily, it's come from athletes and, and their coaches in cooperation. Here we have the example of the, the ski jump and the prevailing techniques over decades and how these have changed that you can see them visually in, uh, to basically a modern technique today. And it was not science that changed that. It was not science that introduced these new techniques. It was, uh, it was the athletes themselves experimenting and finding better ways. And we can see, see the same. This is the high jump technique development across decades with uh, the straddle hop and then progressing all the way to the modern Fosbury flop that is not so modern anymore. It was developed in 1968 by Dick Fosbury. But again, it was, a, it was the athletes that were innovating and finding better ways. The only example I know of in modern sports technique that clearly came from science and not the athletes themselves was the so-called clap skates, the, joint, the hinged speed skate. Uh, it was patented a hundred years before, but it was scientists from the Netherlands and uh, Free University of Amsterdam that actually introduced these skates to the athletes. The athletes were skeptical. They tested them and ultimately understood that yes, they could and did become faster with this different skate that allowed them to use their legs more naturally on the ice. So that's one example. But in general, it's the athletes where innovation has happened from a performance standpoint. Uh, even my own work that's been published and people talk about polarized training or 80-20 training, it wasn't something I invented. It was something I observed in athletes. And it was the athletes over decades that had uh, self-organize their own training towards a, this, this typical training intensity distribution that seemed to be sustainable and effective in multiple sports. Now, sports technology innovation. It sh a, a new technology should solve a specific and real problem that's being experienced by athletes or coaches. And it should improve the development process in a measurable way. This is the test. So new technologies should pass this test. The new technology solves this specific problem for these athletes better than what we did before. And what we see is, as I showed you, sports performance development has had a dramatic 
period of development, but in the last, say, 40 years, it has flattened out because we've kind of started reaching the limits of what how much humans can train and, and, and so forth. At the same time, almost in the opposite direction, sports training technology development has exploded. And so there's kind of a gap. So we have a massive improvement in technology, but that hasn't led to a dramatic improvement in performance. So there is, in a sense, a hype gap, and it's worth being aware of. And this is often the case that when new technologies come, they create big expectations. They're very exciting, and we've all experienced that. Uh, some of us are very early adapters. Some of us wait around a bit, and some of us wait around a long time before we decide to use whatever that new technology may be. But often we see first some inflated expectations, and then we realize, well, that technology wasn't so great, and we get disappointed. But then with time, we see that, well, if we, if we understand the conditions and use it correctly, it may be of some use and, and may change things in, the, in a positive direction. Now, this is a wonderful example of uh, one of the most amazing technological breakthroughs humans have ever achieved, the ability to send a human to the moon. Uh, this, is, this was uh, the third uh, expected flight to that was going to land on the moon it was in 1970 it was apollo 13 but on the way uh, an explosion happened in an oxygen tank and this apollo mission became best known for just the sheer audacity and determination of getting these uh, astronauts home alive which which they did but what's interesting about this entire process where there was a technology breakdown and numerous old school methods had to be used to give these uh, astronauts enough oxygen and, and time to, to make it home. Here we see a trusty watch with a second hand that ended up being uh, a technology that was critical to their survival because that's what uh, Swigert relied on when he was timing a rocket burn that adjusted their course and helped get them back to earth in, uh, safe and sound. So sometimes in these conditions we resort to the lowest common denominator when all else fails and that's also true in sports. Now what are the current developments? Well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk briefly about five different uh, developments. Home and field-based physiology moving laboratory conditions out to the field, movement sensors, uh, real-time movement analysis, big data analytics, and a little bit about some cellular and molecular level technologies. So if we start with physiology, this is, a, this is physiology over 100 years ago, and it's still basically the same today, that in exercise physiology, we have to have a way of having athletes do work in a quantifiable way. Uh, we often call these devices ergometers. This is a bicycle ergometer or work meter. And then we measure the physiological responses, in this case, ventilation and oxygen consumption. So this is, we, I believe, from uh, August Krogh Institute or, or August Krogh's laboratory at the time in Copenhagen, Denmark. Now, this is the early e EKG. This was the first, you might say, heart monitors uh, using the Eindhoven Triangle Principle and being able to achieve an electrocardiogram. It's said that this tool was used uh, by, by uh, Harbig from Germany, the world record holder in the, in the 800 meter uh, back in 1939 and into the 40s. And so these were, this was the harbinger, the first type of uh, device that would ultimately become uh, our heart rate, heart rate watches that we wear today. And of course, we have our physiology labs where we do testing and we measure physiological responses today with the same basic tools. We have to have ways of 
having our athletes do work at, at specific intensities, whether it's a treadmill or a, a bicycle ergometer or a kayak paddling ergometer, what it might be. And then we measure these physiological responses, such as oxygen consumption via ventilation and oxygen, careful measurements of CO2 and O2, and we can measure blood lactate and so forth. But here's what's happening. Those technologies, those measurements are moving out of those traditional laboratories and, and we can do a great many of them at home in our own cycling rooms, our own so-called pain caves on our treadmills and so forth. This is mine. This is my cycling room with a, a simulated bicycle that can is smart and connected to a virtual platform like Zwift and it can change gears and it measures power second for second. And of course, I can measure heart rate and I can measure my own perceived exertion. I can weigh myself before and after to see if I have had a, uh, sufficient hydration. I can measure blood lactate. I can measure muscle activation, muscle oxygenation, heart rate variability, even ventilation with wearables. And I can measure core and skin temperature. And I have actually done all of those things in this home lab. And so the laboratory has been, in a way, collapsed down and is becoming collapsed down into a, a briefcase that we can take with us to the field and, and use devices to get a picture of what the physiological responses are of our athletes. So these are the, day, these are the times we live in, and it's exciting. And, and of course, the, the goal of this, besides lots of numbers for scientists, if it's going to help athletes, it needs to help them with fundamental understanding of what is happening in their training. And basically, there is a, tri a trinity involved. They can measure their power or pace in many sports, not all, but many. They can measure physiological responses in all of these different conditions. And they can measure perception. They can say, how am I perceiving these efforts. And when we put those three together, they can get at how their body is responding, what the internal cost of doing various intensities of external work for various durations. What is that relationship? And how does it need to be adjusted over time and during workouts? And uh, so that's the physiology. And then we have movement sensors. And in modern sports, we can just about put a sensor on any sports implement, from a javelin to a golf club to a tennis racket, even in a bowling ball, on a, on a single scholar in rowing, on the athletes in, in football, soccer, baseball, and so forth. So movement measurement, measuring acceleration, measuring forces, measuring velocity, that has become a fairly straightforward thing to do in almost all sports. Of course, that wasn't always true. A third area of development is real-time video analysis. If we go back to the 70s and 80s, this is Gideon Ariel, who was a pioneer in biomechanical analysis of athletes filming uh, discus throwers, shot putters, and so forth to try to understand their technical developments how, and, and quantify these. It took days, it took unique uh, technology and modern innovators of the time. Whereas today, we're using iPad, uh, smart pads. We're using our iPad or whatever device we might have and we can take videos and go in real time and give feedback to our athletes. We can even do relatively precise analyses of different angles and so forth, uh, the kinematics of different movements, and help our athletes on the fly to get feedback about movement adjustments. And this is a this is an amazing development in the last 20 years. And, and of course, we have bigger treadmills and bigger devices. We can combine s and create environments like this where the coach can actually watch his athlete rather than having them skate by or ski by in the snow, they can use 
these kinds of environments with, with cameras and, and the athlete being able to see themselves from the behind, from the front, from the side, and make technical adjustments. And so this is a great uh, aid to technical or technique development. And then if we go to big data, we've gone from almost having no data about the training process itself to having us almost a data overload in just about 25 years. And if we go back, you know, the, the old school way of describing your training would have been actually to write about it, to have literally a training diary. Uh, and, and some athletes of, of many decades ago would have written things about their own training. Uh, and, and slowly we started to see things like logbooks. Again, it was still all on paper, but it was possible to send away and get uh, these logbooks for each year sent to you in the mail, and you could fill them out, whether it was for runners or for, uh, in this case, for string training. And we start seeing some, some quantitative numbers that are emerging. And then came... Uh, PCs and the internet and now we have our digital metrics and every workout is uploaded to some type of uh, cloud-based uh, application and with daily uh, aggregation of everything that we've done and for many athletes if their if their training sessions are not recorded on Strava or some other device some other application it's almost as if they didn't happen and, and this has made it possible to really understand and see the training of athletes and what it looks like. For example, here, uh, one of my coach colleagues here in Norway, Espen Ereshold, uh, has trained this athlete. He won the uh, Junior World Championship in cycling in, in uh, September of 21. Perestron Hagenes is this athlete's name. And just from going in, to his data over a five-year period from age 14 to 18 it's possible that to to bring out and see his total training hours and how they progress through his teenage years how many training sessions he had each year and the average duration of those sessions and it's also possible to see how his power development over different times has, has gone you see the green line at age 14 progressing up to the red line at age 18 for different times and these are the watts that the individual is able to produce for those time frames amazing data that would have been impossible to collect just a few years ago and we can then see the intensity how much of his time was spent at low intensity or aerobic intensity how much at threshold how much at high intensity and so forth this is where we are today using modern technologies some sports more than others cycling is perhaps farthest along because it's easiest to measure uh, power but all sports are moving in that direction the quantification of every training session but it's worth noting that there are many great great athletes that use very little technology and we do need to understand that the process of training is still about doing the work and so the technologies don't necessarily improve that but they can if we use them correctly and the most important thing is that these technologies need to help us if they're going to be useful they should help us with these basic questions how are you feeling how are you responding to the training that's being prescribed and executed and do we need to make adjustments based on the answers to those first two questions? Now, uh, all of these four types of innovation give better feedback, or at least that is the intention. And if they achieve that, then that's potentially very useful in the, in the sporting environment. Because... The sporting environment is about informing this conversation between coach and athlete through sometimes through numbers like the lactate concentration, but often just through good communication between athlete and coach. 
how is the how does this feel technically how does it feel physiologically how am i responding and then honestly giving feedback to the coach and th that is where the process happens day in and day out and really good training sessions happen when the external and the internal feedback line up this is a beautiful i think a beautiful example from a, a norwegian gold medal winner in in sailing and as as described by arna risa from olympia Toppen here in norway the coach said it i felt it the video camera showed it those there was alignment and when that alignment happened the athlete perceived that the training went well and they made progress so we've got access to a lot of new technologies that can potentially improve the quality of daily training and that is where records and gold medals happen in the daily training that is what lays the groundwork so if the technologies can improve the daily training process then they are useful if not then they're not useful and that's the test and and fundamentally technology the feedback that technology hopes to provide needs to improve the quality of training by informing that communication process here you see uh, Leif o Olaf Olness the coach of, of Karsten Varholm they spend hundreds of hours together per year and that is part of the success of this athlete coach combination but that com that communication can be informed by data and and sometimes this is a this is a beautiful framework i think it's based on fitz and posner in 1967 uh, it was nicely described again by arna risa from olympia talking about technique change athletes have to constantly evolve technically and and doing so is a very challenging challenging process and it involves phases of of alignment and disalignment between what the internal feedback feels like how the body and the the nervous system is perceiving the technique versus the external feedback which is thinking physics and thinking optimization and so you can have a situation where an athlete is not optimally executing technically they're not in line with ideal physics ideal kinematics but their technique feels right because they've done it a million times in that way and so if they begin to break down their technique and try to change it then they will move through phases and initially they will not only it will not only feel uh, no longer feel right it'll both feel bad and be bad and then slowly the technique will improve through the coach's help through the visualization and feedback that's allowing them to to make progress but it won't feel good because it's still very different from what they're used to and then slowly nervous pathways change and and we start to get alignment and the athlete not only is executing the technique in a correct way biomechanically but it also is a it feels right now and they have then made that in complete circle and of course further innovation that process will repeat and the feedback from technology is potentially useful in that process but it's really important for us as sports scientists and technology innovators and so forth to understand that although we love our numbers and lock, like lots of variables for the athlete training and performing it is almost always the case that less equals more they do not want to be overwhelmed by thinking about technique they want to automate and simplify and be able to then think tactically strategically so that the technique comes into the background and is automated and ultimately the athlete has to be able to depend on how they feel in the competition 
if they're paralyzed by or they're dependent on the numbers, then the performance environment will be also uh, paralyzing for them. And so that's not the kind of athlete we want to help create or help develop as sports scientists. And finally, I'll say just a few words about an, uh, a cellular and kind of a biochemical technology development. Of course, that biochemistry and, and physiology and lots of research on nutrition and so forth has resulted in a lot of work related to trying to accelerate recovery, enhance the training stimulus, and so forth. And this has been a fascinating a uh, area of research. And in kind of a hierarchy of needs, if you're doing things correctly in the training um, daily environment, uh, and if you're getting things right, you may reach this point where you are doing some very specific issues like altitude training or heat adaptation or uh, changing the energy availability, how, you know, how much fat, how much carbohydrate and so forth you take in in an effort to try to create an extra stimuli. And in addition, we're seeing that, that things like uh, glycogen and, or reactive oxygen species, free radical oxidation, inflammation responses, that there are attempts to, to modify or reduce those uh, using different uh, nutritional subst uh, substances like antioxidants, like gels and so forth to ensure carbohydrate is available, uh, like anti-inflammatories. And the hope, of course, is to speed up recovery and improve performance. But it's interesting to note that a lot of research in this area suggests that what ends up happening, because nature is very clever, is that if we blunt some of these signals, like the free radicals that are produced, we also blunt or inhibit or reduce the signals for adaptation. So the short-term gain of taking the anti-inflammatories may be in important, but it can inhibit the long-term adaptive process. And so we've learned that you know, our, our biology is, is a complex result of millions of years of evolution. The same molecules that are creating signals that seem to be resulting in pain or inflammation may also be part of the signal for adaptation. So when we try to shortcut our biology with biotechnology, so far, some of those experiments have been shown that our understanding is pretty simple, and often these uh, efforts have been a failure when it comes to actually improving the training adaptation process. So we're still learning there. And with that, I will stop. Thank you for listening.